have the great pleasure of interviewing one of Australia's great journalists. Having had a career in journalism for over four decades, he is no stranger to interviews, so the pressure is on. Lee Hatcher. <laughs> It was Welcome. great to meet you. Thank you so much for having me. You. You've recently uh, started a job as Director of Public Affairs with Hammond Care. Yes. On their website it says, walked into the biggest story in the world today. What's this big story? Well, it's the baby boomer bubble that's coming through and they're starting to get old. They're starting to have more and more complex health issues and that will only become a bigger and bigger story in the decades to come. There are about three million people at the moment over the age of 65. By 2050, that'll be eight million. Now, the fact that we're staying alive for longer and managing our complex health problems is a miracle of modern medicine. It's a great mm -hmm. news story, but there are big challenges and big questions about how we're going to care for those. And I think Hammond Care is at the front line of that. What are, the, what are some of the most crucial things you'd like to achieve at Hammond Care? Well, the Director of Public Affairs takes care of media, both proactively and reactively, policy, politics and publishing. That's my sketch. And it basically is aimed at showing the world a model of care that's been built up over many decades by Hammond Care that is integrated, authentic and good for people and allowing more and more people to share in that. I had uh, my in-laws staying with us. My father-in-law was sadly dying from leukaemia. My mother-in-law had dementia and was on dialysis. We tried for four months to get him into uh, residential aged care and no one would take them both together and with a complex challenge medically of dialysis until we came to Hammond Care. So they're the people who say we will go the extra mile, we will take care of the needy, we will take care of people that other people don't want to take care of. So Hammond Key can say that, and you know, it might sound like spin, but we've actually lived that experience. Can you share a highlight over your career with us? Uh, of many. Yeah, of many. Very privileged opportunities that I've had. Mm. It was very early in my career, in fact, I was 19. I was appointed as the Macquarie Radio Network's Canberra Bureau correspondent, the only person in it. I arrived on Budget Day 1975 and for people who know their Australian political history, that was the beginning of the so-called constitutional crisis of 1975. So it was a baptism of fire. I frankly didn't know much about politics, so I had to learn on the job pretty quickly. And my only claim to fame is being in one of the famous photos of the Whitlam sacking. There is a photo of Gough Whitlam, uh, the Governor-General's official secretary, uh, announcing the proclamation of the dissolution of Parliament on the front steps on that memorable day, and I'm there with my trusty microphone. You'll never recognise me because I've got a beard and much more hair than I have today. <laughs> but it was, um, it was a very famous shot, and it was a very, very early baptism of fire, and it kind of made me into a, the political tragic that I am today. Um, it's a funny kind of job to have because often you're in the midst of large events and meeting significant people and being the reporter to the world, but you've actually got to think about the story and what you're doing, sometimes more than the event that you're witnessing, so that you can actually be a reporter and so that it is on tape and you can get your head around the story. So a huge part of your career was working for the Seven Network. Yes. Can you share some highlights working there? I did two Olympics for them, uh, the Atlanta Olympics and Sydney 2000, as Amazing. their chief Olympic reporter. And they were the broadcast rights holders, Amazing. so it was a yeah. wonderful experience. I was there when Sydney was awarded the Games in Monte Carlo. Wow. And Juan yeah. Antonio Samaranch rose and said those now immortal words, and the winner is Sydney. Yeah. The winner is Sydney. Australia. <laughs> And just as hundreds of people had worked so hard on this bid and hundreds more had travelled here to Monte Carlo from Sydney, so they would party very hard. So lots of very, very big ticket and big events, but equally some of the most significant stories I've done are about people who you would have never heard of and yet their contribution to people and the world has been immeasurable. Just one quick example, we went with Gabby Hollows to Vietnam soon after Fred Hollows died on her first trip 
alone into Vietnam. While we were there, we did an interview and had two hours with a lady who ran an orphanage there, who was very reluctant to talk to us, didn't have the time because she was running an orphanage for abandoned children. It was one of the most moving stories I've done. Christine Nenov is her name. So the job has often been a dangerous job. Can you share some yeah, examples? Yeah, a few times. Probably, undoubtedly actually, the time that I came the closest to losing my life was in the midst of the 1994 bushfires in the Blue Mountains. On the final day of the fires, we had, went into this blaze at Winmalee as it was wiping out a whole street of houses. The Blue Mountains has resembled a war zone today and that's exactly what it is. The enemy is burning on a three kilometre front through the Gross Valley. All day they've been gathering their possessions and packing them up. I lost the camera crew went out because I thought I'd, be, I'd die of smoke asphyxiation actually. This was while the flames erupted around us. And I thought I can't leave them in there. So I ran back in and um, I'd already filed my stand up, which is the 15 seconds that you do the reporter's piece to camera. And I found them and I said, we're out of here. No story's worth more than our life. Mm -hmm. And as I'm running, the cameraman says, I'm rolling, do the stand up again. So I just turned around and rehearsed those lines again, one take, and we just kept on literally running for our lives. And, and within the television industry, it became quite a, a famous stand up. This is the one the people living here have feared for years. There have been so many people here today who've compared this thing here, this monster, with a bushfire that raged through the Blue Mountains in 1968. The weather conditions have been changing all day, sometimes very still, sometimes the wind has been wild. It's wild now. This sounds like a steam train roaring down the hill. It is finally hit. Flames an incredible 70 metres high roared up to Stapleton Road and of all things, Sunset Boulevard, Winmalee. It's raging out of control down a ridge towards Hawkesbury Heights. Lee Hatcher, Winmalee, Seven Nightly News. And it was very real. And it was always, I've always attributed to my cameraman because I, I wasn't thinking about that. But it was, it was very, very close, actually. And we were actually eventually taken into kind of police custody because the police spotted us and they said, you three over here in right. the back of the paddy wagon. So we were held trouble. there for our own protection yeah. for about half an hour. But um, it was amazing. It was very, very close. Talking about chronic fatigue syndrome, yes. you were out of work for two years. One of the um, amazing things that came out of it was I'm, you writing a book, I'm Not Crazy, yes. I'm Just a Little Unwell. Yep. Can you expand on that and other things that happened to you? Well, it was easily the biggest upheaval in my life. I was living a very purposeful and fulfilling mm. and full life as husband, father, and um, you know, pretty high profile journalist and newsreader for the Seven Network. And all of a sudden I had a virus that triggered two and a quarter years in the uh, midst of chronic fatigue syndrome, a much misunderstood illness. And I've always said that people have said, what, what does it feel like? I said, well, if you imagine it's a dose of the flu, like the real flu, mm -hmm. it was just like that every day. And fortunately, I got out of it two plus years later and then went on three years later after that to, to write a book, which to my utter amazement, happened. I, if you'd said to me, you know, five years before, you'll be an author, yeah. and I've now authored three books, yeah, I would have said, you've got to be joking. Yeah. Um, and that became a bestseller, to my utter amazement. So when you first came down with these symptoms, how long did it take them to diagnose you with chronic fatigue? Yeah, it's a good question. It was a year, oh. more through an elimination of other issues. So every test came back quite unquote normal. Sure. Yeah. And I kept saying, the last thing I feel is normal. I, you know, I've lost, lost my health, lost a lot of weight. Um, lots of things were going wrong with my body. Um, I would spend large amounts of each day either sitting around or laying around in bed. Mm. I, I wasn't normal. So it took a year for that to happen. And then it was a year later that it was found that that original virus had basically, it's a very simple layman's way of explaining, played havoc with my metabolic system. So for me, the way out has been to eat, exercise, and live like a diabetic. And that was the, the door that 
I walk through into better health. And and then going into Sky News, yes. a very full on job. Yes. How did you do Indeed. that? <laughs> well, it, that was just like starting again. So I, I first read the news on Channel 7 in 1988, Christmas Eve, one of the most terrifying moments of my life, across New South Wales, across Sydney. And I'd read many news bulletins, done a lot in between then. But after two years of unemployment, and there was a massive crisis of confidence because one of the problems with chronic fatigue syndrome is people treat you like you've either lost a plot or yeah. can't cope or won't cope. And that wasn't the case, but I was then able to get back. My body was able to do it, but my head, for my head, it was just like starting again. So it was, it was terrifying. Sure. And I think it really took about three months for me to start thinking I'm owning my job more than it owned me. But I had a great time with Sky News. I ended yeah. up working with them for 13 amazing. years through an amazing amount of transformation in that place yeah. and the whole emergence of the 24-hour news channel. During Sky News, you also got a job with Open House, yes. Hope 103.2. Yep. How did you balance both jobs? Two jobs, Television yeah. And I know, that's a really smart thing to do. It's yeah. probably one of the most demanding times of my career, juggling two jobs, one in the morning and one at night, on a Sunday night. It was a national radio program. But the most amazing opportunity to speak about life, faith and culture with this remarkable array of people around the world. It was the most, I love interviewing. That's yeah. one of the things that I really do love doing about my job. And from that came two books mm -hmm. and a great body of work, I think, without being kind of proud, too proud about it. But I think it made an enormous contribution to exploring life, faith and culture into the lives of many people around Australia. So you've interviewed amazing people. Yeah. One of who is in our this autumn edition of Living Local magazine, Caroline Stedman. Oh, Caroline yeah. was in my first book, actually. Yeah. In fact, I interviewed her, I think from memory, on the second open house program that I did, so I was still very much finding my feet. It was on Mother's Day, yeah. and she'd been foster mum yeah. to something like 60 plus children, and she had, from memory, six children of her own the most remarkable person. If people haven't read it yeah. in this edition, they must read Carolyn's story. Beautiful woman, yeah. amazing, remarkable woman, and family, actually, yeah. to make such a contribution to so many lives. Yeah. In such a dynamic and cutthroat industry, how have you remained so down to earth? I have a family, yeah. probably is the best answer. I have a wonderful wife, mm. and I've always said about Meredith, She's very adaptable through all the different things that we've done and different life experiences we've had. And she works in the medical and pastoral arena. So it's really different from the media. So that's been good for me. Plus I have four kids. Yeah. And there's nothing more that will keep you grounded as having kids. And I've made a number of really significant decisions in my life to be a relevant father and husband. And they have, as I now look back on it, been the most important, the most significant decisions of my life. So, back to the North Shore. Oh yes. Have you got any favourite places to relax or to you know, visit? What do it's you like to do? It's a good question. We live at West Pimble. Mm -hmm. We're within walking distance of the Philip Moore, the West Pimble village. Yeah. We love it. We've been here four years and I still think how fortunate we are to be in a pretty central location to a lot of the North Shore here. It's one of the great undiscovered treasures, I think, by many people. And um, and the West Pimble Mall. Um, we love eating at Ben Chino's. The cafes are great. There is the best chocolate shop. Yes. Yes. I know that one. A lot of people on the North Shore know about that chocolate shop. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very happy life living yeah. at West Pimble on the North Shore. Yeah.